Okay, it's a great pleasure to introduce our second speaker this afternoon, David Gepner from Johns Hopkins University. David will talk on uh, trace methods in algebra K theory. David, please. All right, well, uh, thank you for the introduction and the invitation. Uh, I was tasked with giving somewhat of a introduction to trace methods and algebraic K theory, but the topological manifestation. So the cyclotomic trace to topological Hochschild homology, uh, to topological cyclic homology, and the Dennis trace to topological Hochschild homology, and why we care about these things. So I guess, especially from the point of view of algebraic K theory. So I'm going to write down these functors that we care about it, for, for this talk, K, T, C, and T, H, H, and also there are, there are maps between them. So this is the cyclotomic trace. And I will explain all, what this stuff is. Uh, this is, you, you sort of take the fixed points of the cyclotomic structure is how you will see we get TC from THH. It's, it's a re refinement thereof. And then you have the sort of more classical Dennis trace map. And this is, uh, so as many people have explained like Bjorn and Dustin, this is a homotopical and it's better to think homotopical than topological. I think that as Dustin just mentioned is an outdated term. <clears throat> it should be called homotopical cyclic homology or homotopical Hochschild homology or cyclic homology over the sphere, Hochschild homology over the sphere, et cetera. But it's a homotopical refinement of stuff that we know better. We have, say, ordinary Hochschild homology. We have negative cyclic homology, and that also similar map. We have a trace, and this is the, well, this is the fixed points of the circle action. Is that interference from me? I hope not. Um, anyway, the, this part takes place, if you want, these are can be computed in the DG world. So we can think of these as living in the derived category of the integers, which you know usually has a different name called chain complexes. But of course, K-theory doesn't live there. It's really in what we might call spectra, but maybe more suggestive notation for that is the derived category of S, where S is the sphere spectrum. And I'll say something about that. Anyway, the what's going on on top is all going on in this category the derived category of the sphere. And this is, a, this is not an ordinary category. In fact, I'm not even thinking of the derived category of Z as an ordinary category. I'm thinking of this as an infinity category and this also as an infinity category. So you, you don't just take the H zero of the complex between, of maps between two complexes. You remember the whole complex. Wait, wait, wait a second. Uh, can you tell us the idea behind an infinity category? Yeah, I'm going to get to that. That's okay. the next okay. step. So first I wanted, but before, before I get to that, I, I want to say something about um, how to think of D of S. That'll be an example of an infinity category. So you can think, think of objects of 
T of S in many ways. I'll give a couple. So one, at least if your objects are bounded above, so there aren't too many negative homotopy groups, um, although I, this can probably be made to work more generally, you can just think of it as a, as literally a chain complex of projective or even free S modules. That's one way of obtaining any spectrum. You can sort of resolve it by free modules and write it down as a chain complex using an infinity categorical version of the Dolb con correspondence. Um, but another way is, homo so this, this is like thinking about it as linearly, but you can also think of it homotopically. So a sequence of pointed spaces, I'll call it Xn, we can index these by the natural numbers or the integers, but X0 needs to be equivalent to the loop space of X1, what is, that's the pointed mapping space from a circle to X1. X1 needs to be loops on X2, et cetera. This is called an infinite loop space for obvious reasons. And these two ways of thinking about an object, uh, and, and, and this is normally what you call a spectrum. So it's built out of spaces. And for example, why is the sphere an object in it? Well, if you just had some XNs and maps, Xn to the loop space of Xn plus one, which is equivalently a map from the suspension of Xn to Xn plus one, you could force these equivalences by replacing the zero space, which I can write as pointed maps from S zero to X zero with, well, the co-limit of this thing, I can take loops on X1 and then I can take double loops on X2, etc. And the point is if I just take Xn to be the N sphere, this describes the object S, which is the generator of Ds in this other sense where you can think of a spectrum as just being resolved by projective S modules, I've just described now the generator for you. So that's one way you can think about these things. And um, why would we work in such a complicated world? Why do we need these S linear objects instead of Z linear objects? Well, we've seen some answers to that question. So the advantage of S linear, S linearity, in this case, one is the, the Dundas Goodwilly McCarthy theorem. Which you know says that K theory and T C are closely related to each other. Namely, that this is a pullback if, well, A to B are connective. That means they don't have negative homotopy groups, S algebras, such that uh, on pi zero, this kernel ideal, this is nilpotent. So we don't have that otherwise, except of course, rationally, 
Um, if, if we're interested in rational information, then we don't have to work as linearly. Um, so a disadvantage, just to be clear, there are disadvantages. Harder to compute. But, so I'll say more about this later, there are some computational advantages as well. Okay, so what more generally is an infinity? Uh, can, oh, well, maybe before I say that, so one nice thing about the functors that we're considering, K, T, C, T, H, H, and let me just say this once again. This is Hox shield homology, but over the sphere, and this is, well, it's the analog of cyclic homology over the sphere, <clears throat> as Dustin explained, but I'll give a more precise definition of that later. But this I say now, because you can just compute it via, say, the cyclic bar construction. There's no, the formula works the same way. Okay, so one advantage about these is they are very general. As we know, we can input non-commutative objects. In fact, like a category. Remember well the fact that you can input non-commutative objects plays a role when you do the fiber and replacements. Um, we don't. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that remark because I don't think I need to take vibrant replacements anywhere um, if I heard that correctly but I mean we're, we're interested in no no what, what, I, what I was saying is that when you write when you say that it's exactly the ordinary construction and so on oh I mean right 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 you, you have to derive the tensor yeah. product and everything like yeah. that. And yeah. also, and you have to have to manipulate fiber and the replacement hazard. Uh, well, right. So that's what I had in mind. And so fortunately and with our mo modern approach to, to this sort of stuff, you don't typically have to worry if something is fiber and a co-fiber. We just work in a natively derived setting where uh -huh. Uh -huh. do algebra and the answer the correct answer pops out, but you have to do it what, correct. What I had seen, yeah, and, what I had seen is that you know, if you try to do it directly by doing the fibrant replacement in the ordinary way, then uh, what happens is that the um, complex, I mean, the, the algebras you are dealing are no longer commutative when you go there. And then the fact that- the, Oh, uh, right. Is, so yeah, you can lose strict commutativity. That's true, but- yeah. Yeah. But we only care about commutativity up to coherent homotopy, which is oh, okay. called the infinity structure. <laughs> but anyway, at least morally, the same formula works. T TC gets yeah, a bit harder, and that's the sure. point of the work of Nikolaus and Schulze, and well, also its original formulation by Bachstadt, Shang, and Matz. Okay, so. Um, but we, but we want to put in non-commutative objects like categories, but we, we need, um, our categories need a notion of exact sequence really to be suitable for input into K theory. They can all be split exact, like in the case of direct sum K theory, but you need some sort of structure like that. And this is the notion of the one good choice is what's called the stable infinity category. Now I'm, I'm gonna say a little bit about what infinity categories are, but let me just say that first the advantage, oh, before I say that, let me say, um, versus say, well, okay, let, let me just say, advantage of stable infinity categories.
there it's a property of an infinity category not extra structure like a triangulation which is the one categorical analog of well it's a one categorical analog really the right the analog here you know infinity categorically you have the notion of stability one categorically you have the notion of abelian and these these are the corresponding notions so being abelian is a property of a one category being stable is a property of an infinity category. So unlike, e.g., triangulated categories, where and also a, a, a big issue is that K theory is not an invariant of triangulated. Triangulated categories in a sense that can be made precise. There are things that you can define that look like K theory there, but the K theory functor that we're used to does not descend to down to that level. So, um, well, I said what the advantage is, what's the disadvantage? Again, you need to. You need to, to know infinity category theory, at least the basics. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. So in the main point is that an infinity category C has mapping, I'll call them spaces, but I'll put it in quotes, really what these should be called are homotopy types. So you mean it's like or an enriched category? Anima. anima, yeah, that's right. But the enrichment isn't extra structure again. It it's, comes directly out of the infinity category. So, for example, if you choose to model an infinity category by a simplicial set, then being an infinity category is just a property of the simplicial set. And the mapping spaces between two vertices in the simplicial set are extracted directly out of the simplicial set. You don't need extra data of an enrichment. Mm -hmm. It's already there. Okay, and um, you know you can pass back and forth. A one category determines an infinity category with discrete mapping spaces, just mapping sets. Um, conversely, if you have an infinity category, you can take pi zero. You can take the connected components of the mapping spaces to get an ordinary category. So you, so you can pass back and forth, but you lose information if you go from a honest infinity category to a one category. So um, let's just say, I'm gonna give you an example. So that was, you know, sort of the philosophy behind it in infinity category. Let's, you know, spaces, which are usually written S, but again, this really means homotopy types because we're not actually talking about topological spaces up to homeomorphism. So I should say the infinity category of, and let, let's give an example of uh, a co-limit. Wait a second, how do you define the ohm between two spaces? Uh, well, that's a, that's a great question actually. So there are various ways you can, do it, but if you think about modeling a, a homotopy type via a con complex, then that's what I have in mind. I mean, you have to do something like that. So right, fiber and stuff. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, um, you, right. You, it helps to have some model lying around, but in the case of spaces, if I want to, one way to present it is via a con complex, and then the, the space of maps between two con complexes is just the exponential in the category of simplicial sets. That turns out to again be a con complex. Understand. And what if I take, for instance, maps from X to the simplicial realization to the, you know, if I use this tautological construction of the vibrant replacements from X to Y, that would work, I suppose. Just to, to force X to be a con complex, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, if, yeah, yeah. Right, so basically you can, so may, a better thing to say here yeah, would, just, would just be that, you know, this really is sort of determined by the category of con complexes and the exponentials between them give you the, the mapping con complexes. So in some sense, S is completely just de determined by that. But once you have the theory set up, you can work in internally to it. Yeah. And in any infinity category, then you have a, a notion of a, of a mapping space between two objects. You have a notion of a co-limit. And I wanted to give a particular example of one that is, you know, interesting. So X is here a space, and I want to take this look at this push out. What I get is the suspension of X. I mean, I'm sure everyone's seen this before. The co-limit infinity categorically, we think about these objects as homotopy types. So if you want, I can replace the point by the cone on X, and I can do that twice, and why do I get the suspension of X? Well, I have X here, and I've, you know, inserted it between two cones on X. So that's the, the picture that's why this is an actual co-limit in spaces, and it has a actual mapping out of universal property. And, um, yeah. You know, it has even an adjoint, which is taking the loop space. Um, so if C is any infinity category with co-limits, you can view maybe a, maybe I should make it pointed just to be safe. Pointed means it has a zero object. So an initial object and a terminal object that happen to agree with one another. Then you have this sigma functor. This is an endofunctor, which suspends. It has an adjoint. And from that, you can, you can say what it means for an infinity category to be stable, I'll just... Mm -hmm state this. So an infinity category C is stable if it, well, if it has a zero object. So these are all sort of exactness conditions. This says that the empty limit and the empty co-limit agree. Well, A, all zero objects are equivalent. So I could say it this way too. A zero object. Um, let's say it, it has finite, I'm purposely saying this so it resembles an abelian category, finite sums and products uh, and these also agree. Yeah, sure, okay. So it has to do with what I was saying at the end. Yeah, the it, exactly. Um, they're byproducts, um, but you don't need to specify yet that they agree. This is just a condition. It has finite sums and products. And what forces everything to agree is that a square in C, let's write it like this, A, B, 
CD is Cartesian a pullback if and only if it's co-Cartesian a push out. And then that, you know, you forced your sums and products to agree by doing this. And you also, this implies that sigma and omega are inverses to each other. So in the example of a, you know, the derived category of S or spectra, two names for the same thing, this is stable. And what is the suspension of an object? I just shift it up by one and loops is shifting it down by one. So you really, once you get used to this, you can really think of spectra as algebraic objects. And they're the higher categorical analog of abelian groups, or maybe it's better to say chain complexes of abelian groups. Yeah, I think chain complexes is better because uh, abelian groups, I mean, you, as we were discussing, when is right. missing something, yeah, sure, okay. So um, in, in a stable infinity category, you have a notion of exact sequence or exact triangle if you prefer, but all it is is a, it's very simple to state. You look at ABC will be exact if, if I can insert a zero here. And this is, well, this is a push out or equivalently a pullback. Because remember, a square is Cartesian if and only if it's co-Cartesian. So in other words, if I call this F in this G, A is the fiber of G. You can think of this as the analog of the kernel. G is the cofiber, or C, if you want, is the cofiber of F. Think of that as the co-kernel. And if I took, you know, the cofiber of G here, what I would get is A shifted up by one, just like we're used to in a triangulated category. So in a stable infinity category, you get your triangles for free. And they come from these bicartesian squares where one of the entries is zero. Okay, and that, you know, because you can continue an exact sequence, that's how you get all the long exact sequences that you would care about. And also, if C is stable, you get something better than just having mapping spaces. Uh, map from A to B in C, I can make an object of, I can make into a spectrum by, well, I'm gonna just take the definition of, you know, a sequence of spaces, one of which is loops on the next. You just replace, you say that the nth thing is just maps from A to the nth suspension of B. So the, the spectrum structure is built in just like in an abelian category, the Hamza. Are... And, the, and the, the additions agree. Yeah. You, the, the additions, additions. To map AB, they agree with the additions. Yeah. The other, so, so. Indeed, yes. So it, you really can think about this like sort of an amalgamation of abelian categories and triangulated categories. I mean, they behave like triangulated categories in computationally, but from a structural, from a, you know, conceptual standpoint, they're all properties of the category. I understand. So, I mean, uh, conceptually, this is the right place to do homological algebra. If right. Exactly. Yeah. And you can even do homotopical algebra because we're working over 
S, we're working S linearly. So now we want to understand, so I told you now what a stable infinity category is. So this is, this is the infinity category of stable infinity categories and exact functors. Exact means what you think it does. It preserves, you know, finite limits and co-limits. And we want to understand it as taking values in spectra or D of S, whatever. I mean, if Ser was around, it would he would tell you that a category of category is not a category because I mean you know you you, you or I mean what, what you have is that the arms are are not, not longer sets or something like that. Right. Um, Right, so so it's an infinity category. Homs are spaces, although it's actually an infinity two category. If you want, you can yeah. the Homs there are functor categories between them, but but because any infinity category has an underlying space of objects, so passing to that underlying space gives you the space of maps between two categories. So we can sort of characterize K by K. K is characterized, in fact, by the, by the fact that it preserves exact sequences. So I told you what an exact sequence was in spectra. I didn't tell you what an exact sequence of stable infinity categories is, but it's the same definition. If, if I'm, if now, now I'm using script letters because I'm sort of one categorical level higher because A and B are stable infinity categories. I can, I can say what, a, what an exact sequence is by asking that this, asking for a diagram like this, by the way, this is pointed. It just so happens that the category with a single object zero happens to be stable. So that's what that, maybe, well, it's usually just written zero, but zero means the category with the single object. Um, this is by requiring that this is both a push out and a pullback. So this is by Cartesian. That's what it means to be exact. Now, because this is always a monomorphism, be because zero doesn't have any endomorphisms, it's, it turns out that that is also mono. And because that's an epimorphism, it turns out that that's an epimorphism. So what you actually get is a fully faithful inclusion followed by a Verdier quotient. That's what an exact sequence of stable infinity categories is. It's a Verdier sequence. In fact, the, the homotopy category of a stable infinity category is triangulated. That's where I forget the mapping spaces and only remember their pi zero mapping sets. <clears throat> so I claimed that K theory is actually characterized by this fact, how, why is that true? Well, although, well, this category of stable infinity categories is pointed, it has zero, it is not, it, and, it, and it even has finite sums and products agree. So it's, I guess what you would call semi-additive, but it's not stable. What, and what, if you try to, to stabilize it in the naive way by passing to spectrum objects in your category, you'll get zero just okay. for a practical reason. Yeah. Yeah, I have one question then. Mm -hmm. I mean, if finite sums, if it is pointed and finite sums and products agree, 
-hmm. then uh, modulo set theoretic considerations, the endomorphisms of an object have to form a, a semi ring. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's right. Is it a group? Is it an abelian group? Or no, 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 it's, it's not. It's a that's semi ring. The... Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, it's. Wow, okay. We are getting on a good, very good, uh, <laughs> very good count. I see. Very good. No, so the, um, the addition has inverses, yeah? Uh, well, inside the categories, but I mean, I can't. Um, no, not uh, replacing. Oh, no, in, in this one, in, in the stable. Yeah, case, this uh, one. That's what I am talking about. Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah, yeah. So, okay. so we agree. Yeah, we agree completely. Okay. Um, so, so it's not stable. So, so you can actually stabilize it in a different way. You 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 can't do it in the usual way by passing to spectrum objects because you'll just get zero. But you can do it in a in a different way, differently. So I have this category, and. Well, I'm just going to embed it in its pre-sheaf category by Yoneda. Now, this is infinity categorically, so it won't be pre-sheaves of sets. It'll be pre-sheaves of spaces. So S, remember, was spaces, but that's terrible terminology, of course. I have to stop saying that. Dustin. Wait, 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 wait uh, just a second. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there, is, there is another theory which I don't know. Which is a theory of infinite topos. Is it something like that that you get here? Yeah, th this is an example of an infinity topos. Yes. Oh. Okay, very good. But it's it's not going to be for for long because the next step oh. is to stabilize this in the usual way by instead of by promoting, you know, you can take a set and make it abelian an abelian group by taking the free abelian group on it. You can take a space and make it into a spectrum by, well, the way sort of forcing it to be a spectrum. So that's, you, you do that. I just now, well, remember spectra is D of S. I guess I'm switching between notations here. And unfortunately, now you've lost the fact that here, this had exact sequences, but you know they involved the fact that C could be viewed as B mod A, and the Unita embedding destroys any any co limits. So we, you want to reintroduce them. So wow. these will be those are our generators, but we're going to introduce. So the, the pre-sheaf category is generated by, you know, representables. So the generators are the stable infinity categories still, but now we're going to impose the relations. And the relation is, is just that, maybe I'm going to write just brackets, this functor. The relation is, you know, bracket, I'll write it like this. Bracket C is equivalent to, you know, B mod A. If there's a Verdier sequence, aka an exact sequence, A to B to C. And this, this thing now has a name. This is what has been called non-commutative motives. It's maybe a terrible name, but it has a name. And it's a stable, this is a stable infinity category. And in it, it, it remembers all the K theories. So K of C is just maps in this category, N moat from, well, the, the sphere to C. Here, I really mean, I'm, if I, just as a matter of notation, if I input something that looks like a ring, the stable infinity category associated to it is its derived category, or really is 
bounded derived category because I want these to be small for technical reasons. So this really means dB of S or finite spectra. And the G theory, this is bivariant. I would have, if I had switched the order. Yeah, sure. I was, I was going to I ask have gotten that. Yeah. that. And I, this, of course, has precursors in, in you know, K theory of C star algebras. Um, but we just got it by constructing by stabilizing stable infinity categories in a slightly different way and remembering the exact sequences that we cared about. And what this allows us to do then is um, we can classify all trace maps. I mean, this dual okay. theory should be something like k-homology, but in the algebraic sense. Right, yeah. Exactly. So if F is, is some functor from stable infinity categories to spectra, which preserves exact sequences, then we get that, you know, the space of maps from K to F is just equivalent to F evaluated on the sphere. So for example, THH of the sphere, well, what is that? That's the Hochschild homology of the sphere over itself. So I just get that. I should have mentioned earlier that S, there's another way of thinking about S. S is the Grotendieck group completion. of the semi-ring fin of finite sets and isomorphisms between them. So that's another way of thinking about S. Um, so in, just like Z is the group completion of, of N, from that you can just sort of read off the fact that pi zero of the sphere has to be equal to the integers. So there's a generator. And that generator corresponds to the, to the Dennis trace map. You can you know, run a similar story for TC and get the cyclic atomic trace. So that was what I wanted to say involving how these functors and the maps between them actually appear. Okay, now I wanted to say what is TC? So there's a similar, so Nikolaus and Schultz uh, also take what you could call a motivic approach. Similarly, you know, they, they design a category called cyclotomic spectra. This is a stable infinity category. It's a big stable infinity category, just like non-commutative motives where the mapping spectra are TC. So specifically, um, an object X of cyclotomic spectra is a, is a spectrum X, so with a circle action. Because spectra are directly built out of spaces, it really, you can honestly think about a circle action here. Really, you should think of it as maybe only being defined up to homotopy, but that's okay. Um, it's a spectrum with a T action and some maps, which we call Frobenius maps for all primes P. 
which go from X to X to the TCP. And these are also T equivariant. So we saw the Tate construction appear before, but just to recall, it is if, you know. Yeah. Let me just ask a question because uh -huh. I know the notion of a, a cyclotomic spectrum from the book of um, Dandas uh, uh, Goodwill and McCarthy. So, yeah. I mean, um, uh, um, Bjorn, are you around? Yes, I am. It's not. It's it's very closely related. Uh, so, so the okay. notion of Nicholas Schultz is slightly. So, and I think David is going to explain it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. So it, I'm unfortunately running out of time, but to, to Bjorn's comment is right on. And um, so there is one important difference in that in order for the Nikolaus Schulz machinery to work, you really have to work with bounded above spectra. The spectra can't be, have infinite negative homotopy groups. In so you mean bounded, if they, bounded below, you mean bounded, you said bounded above. Oh yeah, <laughs> I meant bounded below. Thank you. Um, so um, otherwise, you have to use the machine of equivariant homotopy theory, which is how TC was formerly defined, and and it's, it's you know a, a great definition as well. It's just takes considerably more technology to set up. And the Nikolaus Schultz approach streamlines calculations when you can do it, essentially because it decouples all the primes. Uh, well, that's one reason. And these Frobenii, you know, behave like you sort of expect a Frobenius uh, to work. And then TC of X, well, so just in the interest of time, we'll just say that TC of X, is maps in this category of cyclotomic spectra from the sphere again, which has a canonical cyclotomic structure because it's THH of the sphere and THH of anything has a canonical cyclotomic structure to some other cyclotomic spectrum X. Okay, so, um, <sighs> And you can also, I mean, there's other formulas for what that is in terms of TC minus and TP, it fits into a fiber sequence involving the Frobenii and whatnot, but you can also just define it that way. So TC of a ring R or a, a ring object in D of S, is by definition TC of THH of R because THH of R, you know, happens to always carry the structure of a cyclotomic spectrum because it can be built out of the cyclic bar construction. Okay, so in my last minutes, I just wanted to say that um, even though, as Dustin pointed out in his talk, the cyclotomic trace can be often very far apart. You can still use the trace to distinguish elements in K theory. And I wanted to just briefly discuss an application. So you have Quillen's localization sequence which relates K of FP to K of the P local integers to K of Q. And we can think of Q as of course being ZP one over P and we can think of FP as quotienting out by P. So you have the closed and the open part and the middle term is somehow an extension of those. So there are, there are more primes, there are more what are called chromatic primes in D of S, but they, they lie over a given prime 
in the integers and and there they correspond to their residue fields kn which are called the morava k theories which are certain spectra but all you have to know really is that their homotopy groups look like FP with this VN, VN inverse. And VN sits in degree two P to the N minus one. So Blumberg and Mandel, so for the, people who actually care about inputting rings in D of S into the K-theory machine instead of just ordinary rings. They bumped this up to higher chromatic primes. There's something called, well, I'll just call it BP1, and this is BP0, I'll say with E0. This is actually what you could call BP minus one and BP zero. And uh, there's supposed to be a one here. We don't see your writing now. Oh, I was writing here. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry. And these, these see the, these BP ends, they're usually written with a pointy bracket, but I'm just keeping notation similar. These BP ends see stuff up to chromatic height N. And their homotopy groups, they're sort of like the local rings of the fields they look like this local ring, except now instead of just a VN, I have V1 through VN, but these are all in de positive degrees. So on pi zero, you just see ZP. So the underlying ring of this is a local ring. And well, just as a, Quick application, you know, you could Alsonian Ragnes asked if, as part of their redshift program, is apparent here. They asked, is um, K of BP n minus one to K of BP. N, so this is BPN mod VN, and this is this EN thing that's related to Morava E theory or Lubin Tate theory. This is BPN with VN inverted. They asked, is this exact? And well, you can, so. I was planning to present this, but I don't have time, but let's just, I'll just wrap it up by saying easy trace arguments show that this fails after the Blumberg-Mandel case, n equals one. So you have to, K-theory does shift chromatic height and I wanna advertise paper on redshift by uh, Jeremy Hahn and Dylan Wilson, which recently appeared, which really gives a very strong redshift result. So, um, and it makes, you know, full use of the cyclotomic trace. It, it uses trace methods heavily to actually compute that K-theory raises chromatic height and various circumstances, which is an important thing because we don't have many examples of higher chromatic rings. 
All right, let me just stop there. Thank you very much, uh, David. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Okay, so let me stop the recording first and then we go to.